sitting here in open sky house on the banks of the river Rhine together with Premananda. Premananda, we want to interview you for your own project, European Masters, Blueprints for Awakening. And these questions are designed and unfold your teachings and are asked in the context of the teachings of Ramana Maharshi which reflects the ancient wisdom. Before, before we start with the questions, I would like to make a statement that I have no my own teaching. And if I, if I consider that, I can see that um, I, have my, I have no own teaching because I have no real mechanism to create a teaching. So what I can say is that um, I'm a kind of messenger or I'm a conduit or channel for the teachings of Papaji, who was my direct master, and Ramana, Sri Ramana Mahashi, who was his master. And I feel a deep inner bond to that lineage, which seems to go back into the uh, mists of time, in the mists of Indian ancient time. And so there is nothing personal in anything I would say. The only part I can consider personal would be my personality and the way I express this. Do you feel very connected with India also? You say Indian ancient. Yes, for some reason, uh, when I was about 30, uh, my life took me to India, and in the last uh, 30 odd years, I've spent um, uh, something like 12 years living in India, and for the last 10 years, I've returned to Arunachala in South India um, each January for a month or two. So there is a deep bondage with, with India, but it's hard to really say if it's really what exactly this is. Sometimes it feels as if it's the, a bondage with an ancient part of humanity, something like this. But yes, I'm always very touched. As soon as I arrive in India, um, it feels like I'm swimming in a different ocean. Can we start the questions? <laughs> there is the fundamental question, who am I? Who are you? Well, there's different ways I would approach this answer. Probably the most fundamental answer would be to say nothing, just silence. And then probably the next would be to say something like, I am that, which is a sort of spiritually correct answer. But the real answer is that I don't know. And the other answer coming from the ancient Indian wisdom would be to say, I'm Satchitanand. And sat is truth, chit is consciousness, and ananda or nanda is, is bliss. And these three words are pointing to something very fundamental. And together these three words, sat, chit, anand, also are pointing to Brahman, which is um, consciousness.
Many seekers are looking for enlightenment as if it is an experience. What is enlightenment? It's a word. And this word is one of those words which has a strong emotive energy in it. And when I was younger, it had the effect of completely changing my life. Because when I was about 30, um, this word first came to me. And it came to me in a context where something could happen to me and I saw it as a kind of solution to my situation when I was 30. And my situation when I was 30 was that I was already a slightly successful person in the way that society judges those things. So actually my life was okay. But inside, already for about 10 years, I'd had a sense of dissatisfaction disorientation, an inner sadness. I'm not quite sure the right words to find. And this had led me in my 20s to go on to some kind of seeking, some kind of searching. And in the beginning, I had no idea what I was searching for. I wasn't a particularly spiritual person in those days. In fact, I was an architect. But anyway, this, this seeking took me to Japan, and somehow I was drawn to Japan partly for its architectural excellence and partly for its spiritual um, excellence. So, so coming to Japan when I was 30 was somehow when my life moved into the spiritual world, if you like. And at that point, I came across this word enlightenment. And it was a very important word in, at that time in my life because it gave me something where there could be a solution. There could be something different happening inside me and that this would happen from this thing called enlightenment. And it drew me to India. It drew me to an ashram from Osho. And almost daily, he was talking about enlightenment. This was back in the mid-70s, 1970, I'm not sure, 76 maybe, something like 1976. And um, he talked a lot about enlightenment. And he talked um, every, every morning. And he talked about all different kinds of masters from China, from uh, Japan, the Buddha, Jesus, he talked about all these ancient masters in the context of their enlightenment and was somehow um, making the possibility that I could also become enlightened. And so um, I thought, okay, that's very good. I'll definitely go for enlightenment. So in those days, this word was very fundamental in changing my life and very attractive. And for a number of years, it kept me going with my uh, meditations and my you know, psychology workshops and uh, giving up my architecture. It gave me some kind of um, point. It gave me some sort of point that I could come to, a sort of achievement. There could be an achievement. Because, of course, in those days, I still... Um, understood myself to be a somebody, and this somebody could become enlightened. So I would say that that word was very useful in those days, and I would say that later um, it became a difficult word and in a way was holding me in an idea that I could get something, and if I, if I could get something, then... It was also holding me in this idea that I was a somebody who could get something. So I would say that later on it became a difficult word. And then later on when um, 
Osho had, had left. I has, uh, my life took me to another master, Punjaji, Papaji, uh, in Lucknow. And when I arrived there, after already spending something like 16 years um, with different spiritual practices, very much as a seeker of enlightenment, I was totally shocked um, when I realized that um, there was no such thing as enlightenment. And that took my mind some time to kind of adjust to. And so there was an adjustment time where every day I, I heard Papaji talking about the self. And the idea out of that was that, you know, there is a fundamental space, which, if you like, is also an answer to your first question, which uh, Ramana Mahashi particularly called the self, and which Papaji called the self. And this is a space which was always there. So then I started to realize that this thing that I could achieve called enlightenment was already there, had always been there. So all my striving for all those years to come to enlightenment, which felt like you know Mount Everest or something, the summit of Mount Everest, I suddenly realized that this searching for enlightenment had been in a way with no point. And he, if you like, turned my search around and he turned it around in a way that I started to see the value of asking myself about this I, about this somebody. And until that point, I had never really investigated this somebody who would become enlightened. I'd taken it as a, as a given. And it seemed to be supported because whenever I would read different spiritual masters' books, they would always somehow have some very exciting moment when they had become enlightened. And so I basically bought the story. In those days, I wasn't sophisticated to see that probably these stories were written by disciples and probably they wanted to glorify the, the achievement of the master and probably um, these fantastic kind of moments of enlightenment when 10,000 suns exploded or such things um, were not real. They were just a metaphor. Mm -hmm. And I bought the story. What about awakening, this word? The, does it feel more clear? And did you have a moment of awakening? <clears throat> Well, awakening is more, um, more sympath sympathetic because the word awakening suggests that, you know, we're a kind of asleep in the assumption of this I. We're asleep in the assumption of being a somebody. And we wake up from this dream to the reality. So awakening can be a, a better word than enlightenment, but I think I prefer self-realization. And the idea of this is that there is a moment, and it's like a, a moment in time, you can say, when in, in that moment you realize that in fact you've always been the self and you were never a separate somebody, mm -hmm. that you realize you were always the ocean and you were never the waves, the separate individual waves on the ocean, that those waves have always been part of the ocean. And this realization came to me gradually in the first few weeks that I spent with Papaji. It was a difficult time because it felt like I had to decondition myself um, from something which didn't seem true anymore and be open to understand what it meant this new self. And what actually happened was that after 
being with Papaji for a few weeks and asking him three questions. On the, on the, on the occasion of the third question, sitting in front of him, um, he was able to take my words and um, <clears throat> through the power of his energy, he was able to somehow take me deep inside and something happened. And what I could say now, looking back on that, which was about um, 18 years ago, um, what I could say happened was that everything seemed to dissolve. So in, in the moment of sitting there, um, looking inside, um, there was an enormous en energetic force that um, completely wiped out anything that I could call premananda. And in fact, I can remember it visually, I can remember it as a kind of whiteout. I, I looked inside myself, I remember, and it was like I was in a, in a, in a, in a, in a snowstorm. It was completely white and it was completely quiet and I couldn't open my eyes. So there was a very strong energetic happening, which went on for some longer time. And um, <clears throat> it was supported by, very much supported by uh, Papaji. He, um, after some longer time, kind of brought me out of this. I was able to open my eyes again. He, he took me up on his um, uh, platform and he um, supported me, gave me water. Um, I'm sure he must have said a few things. I don't know what they were. And he kind of brought me back into the room. But actually, I, I wasn't functioning. So I wasn't really functioning for even, I could say, some longer time. But certainly in that moment of the meeting with him, um, something very profound happened. And... Um, he somehow gave some support or recognition, you could call it, to that happening by, in fact, stopping the meeting and uh, allowing the rest of the meeting to be a, a celebration. So people sang and uh, there was music and singing for the rest of the meeting. And then he called me back at the end of some time um, and um, I was feeling a bit like a bag of potatoes. And he looked down at me and he said something like, well, you don't need to come tomorrow. And, um, and then he left and I was left. And I sat, I remember for a long time with some friends around and um, I would say for at least the next month, it was very energetic. And I did go in the next day. And I went, in fact, every, almost every day for the next five years. But whatever happened on that day, <clears throat> which I would call self-realization, was undoubtedly a total change in my life. And so, um, there was never a question again. And this whole question about enlightenment completely disappeared. The seeker of enlightenment completely disappeared. And the kind of suffering or the kind of struggling that this somebody had been busy with for something like uh, 25 years in a conscious way, disappeared. And I can honestly say that from that day until this day, whatever happened on that day um, has never really changed. Nothing's really changed. Something very fundamental shifted. So I could even say, okay, that was my enlightenment, but I couldn't possibly say that. I don't think anybody could ever say that because there is nobody to be enlightened simply. 
but it was a profound meeting between myself and Papaji. And um, <clears throat> it's been, if you like, a moment in my life where I can say from that moment, my life has, has, has been very different. You describe it mainly as an energetic thing. Could you also say there was understanding? Yes, there, I can say that there was a profound understanding, which was not really, I think, at the level of the mind, it was not really at the level of the emotions. It, it was as if some deep part, which we could call the being, the soul, the, the intuition, the, the self, it was as if the self woke up and said, hey, guy, now I'm in charge, you know? And so that was very, very beautiful, very beautiful. And <clears throat> I can say that I've always felt a tremendous gratefulness to Papaji because I'm sure without his ability and his incredible energy, I don't think I would have understood because I had been going already 16 years. I was already about 48 years old. I'd been a very dedicated seeker, but I had never understood that I was seeking something that was, in fact, impossible to reach. It was like I was searching for the end of the rainbow very dil diligently, but I didn't know that all the time the rainbow was moving with me, you see. So out of that, of course, I have a tremendous gratefulness. And Out of that, I felt I have nowhere to go, actually. And so after this all happened, things after a month or so, things got a bit more ordinary. And um, then I should somehow decide what I'm going to do. But I, I really couldn't decide. I mean, the only decision was to stay where I was. And I stayed where I was for nearly five years. Um, I ran a, he asked, he suggested, and I accepted the idea of running a guest house, which provided me with a, a basic income to, to live there. Um, gave me a sort of project to support him and the, the Sangha. And so I ran a big guest house for the next five years. And in my inner searching, there was simply no question anymore. So, what I'm calling self-realization resulted in no more questions. So even though I was sitting there in the satsangs for the next five years, I never once felt any kind of question. You said that you um, did quite some practice with Otto meditation. Are there any qualifications for enlightenment? Is practice necessary? If yes, what form would you advise? <clears throat> This is a kind of interesting question, you see, because from where I'm sitting now, I can say no practice is needed. You can wake up right now. But in my own life, I have to admit that did not happen. It happened in Ramana Mahesh's life. So he, he had a spontaneous awakening or some moment of self-realization when he was only 17 years old. So he hadn't done any practice at that point. And in my own case, I was 48, and I had done 16 years of fairly intensive meditation practices. Um, so what to say? What to say, you see? Because I can, I can now, from my vantage point, I can say to anybody that you don't need to meditate. You see? So in one way, there's no need to meditate. But for most people who I would meet who are interested in, um, in discovering themselves, usually these people have a busy mind. Usually 
um, the conditioned mind has been filled up and because of all this busyness and chaoticness inside, it's very hard for these people to just be calm and peaceful. It's even hard maybe to listen because they're so fit, full already with all kinds of ideas, all kinds of concepts, that they're not even able, if you like, to, to listen and take in a new understanding. So in this circumstance, it seems to me that I would definitely give the advice to this kind of person that meditation would be a useful spiritual practice. What particular form of meditation would be less um, important? And in fact, I would suggest um, to try different kinds of techniques, Tai Chi, yoga, sitting meditation, active meditation, and find out for yourself what really you like and what you feel comfortable with doing and what seems to work for you. And then I would definitely su suggest making this practice regularly um, until the mind becomes quieter. So for somebody in that situation, I would certainly suggest a practice. For somebody who has already got a quieter mind, either naturally because they've you know, been born into a situation where their life was very much on the earth, and, and therefore much more natural, or for somebody who's been living in the West but has somehow got a quiet mind through some already some kind of practices, for, for such a person who comes and says, you know, I'm interested in self-realization, then I would suggest the best possible thing is to... Um, is to use self-inquiry. And self-inquiry is something that was suggested by um, Sri Ramana, um, but is, is coming, I think, from an ancient wisdom. It wasn't particularly um, his idea. And basically, self-inquiry is a kind of investigation. So for, if you like, an advanced seeker or somebody who, who really has naturally a quiet mind, I would suggest um, self-inquiry or just simply being quiet or simply um, just watching, you know, to, to, to become aware, to just to watch what, what is happening inside, to simply, if you like, change the focus from the world outside to looking what's going on inside we can say inside and outside it's not maybe inside and outside but just um, to make it more simple i would say to look inside mm -hmm. so in that sense i would say there are some qualifications but actually fundamentally um, there is no qualification this moment of, of realization can come to anybody in any moment, in any place. And it seems to be that in the last years, this has been happening in all kinds of situations, like a supermarket or you know, walking by the river. It's been happening to more and more people that they've had some kind of moment of self-realization without, without any practice, without any, any preparation, if you like. You already mentioned self-inquiry. Ramana said self-inquiry is the most direct route to realizing the self. What do you say about self-inquiry and how to conduct self-inquiry? <clears throat> well, Fundamentally, self-inquiry is suggesting this change, you know. It's suggesting, instead of looking out into the world, it's suggesting a 180-degree turn 
to looking at the inner world. So the, the, the fundamental idea of self-inquiry, as the words suggest, is to inquire about the self, to inquire, you know, what is really going on inside. And this immediately creates some ability at being aware. So this word awareness gives us this understanding, if you like. We start to get more and more sensitive about looking and seeing what's really happening. For example, a simple example, uh, you come into a room and you leave your shoes outside the room. And then somebody asks you, where are your shoes, right? Many people wouldn't even remember, you know, did I leave them downstairs? Are they outside the door? You know, blah, blah, blah. They wouldn't remember. They just don't have their shoes. But if you're becoming sensitive and you've got a strong awareness, then you immediately know exactly where your shoes are, for example. That's rather a sort of simple example. But more and more self-inquiry is suggesting an inner looking so that we come to really know ourselves. We know our uh, structural pattern, the patterns of our mind. Um, we come to know um, our emotional responses to certain situations. We come from, become very familiar with the workings of the mind. And um, we also become more and more aware about the body, the body-mind connection and our, if you like, our relationship with the body-mind connection. And all of this is, if you like, the beginning of self-inquiry. And then gradually um, you come, if you like, more intensely into all that. And um, Ramana Mahashi makes a very specific suggestion. And his specific suggestion which is in his small teaching booklet, which is called Who Am I? I think it's question 12, maybe 11. And in this question, he answers how to do self-inquiry, how to make self-inquiry. And he suggests a very simple and very exact way of conducting self-inquiry, which is to investigate to whom the thoughts arise. So, okay, you, you, you're doing your awareness practice. You're looking at yourself constantly. You're looking inside. You become aware of lots of thoughts arising. And normally we get very attached to those thoughts very easily. And he's suggesting look at those thoughts and go back to the source of the thoughts. Don't care about the thoughts. Don't give any energy to the thoughts give the energy to find out to whom are those thoughts arising. And so you, you first look and you ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts arise? And the answer is to me because I'm identified with being a separate somebody. And then I ask, who is this me or who am I? This who am I has become a kind of famous catchphrase. But basically, you're, you're then investigating who exactly is this me that you, we're so identified with. And when you ask this second question, you find yourself being taken deeper and deeper inside. And the answer to that second question is not an answer, as I expressed in, in, in my answer to the first question in, of, of the interview, um, there's no real answer. So this, this question leads you into silence, if you like. It leads you into the mystery of the self. And of course, the first time you do that, you probably come up with something like, I'm a doctor, or I'm an architect, or whatever it is, or I'm a man or a woman. But you quickly see that this kind of intellectual inquiry isn't going to help you very much. And so there's no point in answering in that way. What we're looking for is a much deeper answer. And 
the experience that I've had is that um, if people intensely ask these questions, these two questions, in exactly in the way that Ramana suggests in his little booklet, then many people have had a profound effect from these two questions. I was quite shocked actually because I started satsang teaching when I was living in Australia and I suggested this practice in a slightly intellectual way and there was no results. Nobody ever really wanted to talk about it. Nobody apparently even ever really practiced it. And then existence brought me to Germany. And in the beginning of my time in Germany, I also suggested self-inquiry. And then I was shocked because people started coming to me and saying, well, we tried your self-inquiry and uh, incredible things happened. Like, you know, my mind stopped or, you know, I was blissed out for three days or all kinds of amazing answers came out of this inquiry. And in the last uh, six years, living here in Germany and traveling now intensely through Europe, suggesting self-inquiry, there's been many people, and many people I would say is, let's say 50 plus people, have had some kind of profound opening, um, which in some cases, um, at the time, one might be tempted to call self-realization, um, out of doing the self-inquiry um, as a very strong reminder. And I think I can understand how it works because normally when a thought arises, thoughts just arise for no reason. I mean, they're just spontaneous thoughts running all the time. And what tends to happen is that we immediately grab a thought and we say, you know, my thought, I thought to go on holiday to Spain. When actually it was just a thought about Spain because the sun was shining or something, you know. But we say, oh yes, I had the idea to go to Spain. And what Ramana Maharshi's self-inquiry is suggesting is that um, if you investigate this, you discover very easily it's got nothing to do with I. There wasn't anybody. It was just a thought. And as you gradually get more and more involved in seeing that, if you like, you can say the attachment, the the, the glue of attachment to the thoughts somehow gets loosened. And so this whole conditioning of, of, of me gets loosened. It's like you don't quite believe anymore so strongly about this me. And so this self-inquiry then is, is absolutely a ripe tool for or if you like, a golden key, you could say it's a golden key to discover that you're not anybody. And so, as I say, there's been quite a large number of people who have, if you like, woken up or they've had an opening to discover that I'm not somebody. And so self-inquiry, I would say, is, if you like, the last thing that I believing myself to be a somebody is the last thing that I can do. It works. And after that, it, there's nothing more that, you can, that I can do. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, I can agree with Ramana Maharshi because he used to say this is the most direct way to self-realization. And he would advise anybody who asked him to try self-inquiry. And I feel um, absolutely um, in support of that, out of the experience that I've had in the last five or six years with many people who've come and had my advice or his advice. When Ramana was asked, when will the realization of the self be gained? He replied, when the world, which is what is seen, has been removed then there will be realization of the self, which is the seer. What is the true understanding of the world and how to remove the world? Mm. Well, first of all, to be very clear, 
um, when we look out through the eyes, we see something. There's no way we can remove that. So this statement definitely does not mean that, you know, there's some kind of trick and after that you don't see anything, you know. It's like nothingness. It's not, it, it's not like that. So this, this statement can't be taken literally. Either the translation um, could have been more sensitive or he's using this as a metaphor to show something. So what I can say about that is that the, the world, the apparent world, is something that actually comes from here. I could use the word inside. Actually, I don't really believe it's inside. I, I think something else is happening, but for the simple, simplicity of what we're talking about, I can say inside rather than outside. Outside is the world and inside is, is here. And from this here, the world is, is arising. It seems to me that the world arises from, from the mind. And so what, what he's really talking about is not the physical world apparently out there. What he's really talking about is the mind in here. If it is in here, I personally think the mind is, is all around us. But anyway, um, he's really talking about a metaphor of the mind. And what does he mean? He means that um, we, we have been conditioned by our growing up process. We've been conditioned to discover ourselves as separate from the world and separate from the other, other, the other person. So we've been brought up in our conditioning that I and you, me, and they. So, two. So we've been brought up in a duality. And this duality is, if you like, the world, and I'm here separate from the world. And that brings up a lot of problems, and if you, if you like, sufferings, because it, uh, I perceive everything as a situation where I have to make my life out there in the world. And that leads to things like, you know, ambition and uh, competition and a, a sense of uh, being separate, being alone, um, being lonely, and so on. The re reality is that everything is one. And this apparent world, which, for example, contains air, and this air is something which I need to, to breathe, there is no, there's no separation of that, because this, this air is provided, and I'm not separate from that air. Fruit growing on the tree is provided, and I'm not separate from that fruit. And so, so the reality is that, that everything is one, but we've been brought up in a duality where there is a separation. And so what this statement from Sri Ramana is suggesting is to investigate our relationship with the world. And as you start to do that, you then discover this whole thing of the ego, the separate identity, you discover the conditioned mind, you discover your attachment to the conditioned mind, um, <clears throat> you see perhaps the possibility um, of a small child, for example, who has no, not had the time yet to be very conditioned, and you see that small child playing in a very spontaneous way, and you see that small child uh, responding to the situation creatively, and you see, if you like, the conditioned adult uh, responding to situations in, in reaction. 
because they're reacting, if you like, from something inside themselves. They're reacting from their conditioned mind into the situation. They're not really there present in the moment as a young child, for example, would be because in that moment, the power of their conditioned mind is somehow greater than the power of, of, of the emptiness that could be, they could respond from. And you gradually see all this thing as you investigate the world. And so what I think Sri Ramana is really pointing to is the possibility of self-realization. That if you realize the self, then effectively, in the realization of the self, you're coming to understand that everything is one and that there is no separate world. And then, if you like, you have removed the world. But this is not that the world disappears simply, but the relationship disappears or changes. So what happens is that um, in the moment that the realization occurs, the uh, attachment and the belief of being a separate somebody simply collapses in one second. It just collapses because self-realization is a moment of clear seeing where this fundamental illusion suddenly, um, how can I say, parts, you know, you, the curtain parts. And you're left then maybe feeling rather disorientated. I remember in my own case, I was very disorientated for some days, if not some weeks, because um, I'd been hanging on to this illusion that I was a separate somebody with a name, with a job, you know, with a relationship, and so on. I've been holding on to this whole kind of story, my life. I've been holding on to that for uh, 48 years, completely believing it. And suddenly, in only a moment, in one second, I absolutely knew, without any doubt at all, that that was absolutely not true. And so I was left kind of disorientated by that discovery. But what gradually happened in my own case was that um, as things, if you like, settled down, I discovered that there had been some inner shift. And so what actually happened was that for about a month or six weeks after this moment that I'm calling self-realization, there was a lot of energetic happenings going on inside. It felt like some sort of inner washing machine was running and that everything was getting kind of changed around. And during that time, um, there wasn't really a feeling of peace. In the first few days, there was an immense peace my eyes looked like, uh, you know, empty moons, you know, calm, peaceful, deep. Nothing was really happening in the beginning few days. And then gradually, if you like, things got more ordinary. And you could say that gradually Premananda came back. And then uh, I can say in a longer, going into a longer period, um, I noticed that um, things were much, much quieter than I'd ever noticed before. And um, there therefore was much more happiness, kind of what I would call calm happiness than I'd ever really felt before. And gradually over some months, some years I would say, I started to notice that various structures of the mind, clouds, if you like, that used to pass by, familiar bits of uh, premananda that used to pass by, certain thought processes, 
that were rather familiar, they just simply disappeared. It wasn't really that anything happened. There was no effort. They simply disappeared. And the analogy I would make is a blue sky with white clouds. And these white clouds, if you like, are thoughts, or these clouds are ideas, or they're even a structure of the mind, a familiar structure of the mind, something like, I'm not good enough. Something very familiar, which had always been believed before. I believed it. You know, I'm not good enough. Suddenly, these clouds seem to just dissolve into the blue sky. And sometime later, I realized, wow, for a month, it seems that I never thought I wasn't good enough. So it wasn't like I became good enough suddenly. It was just kind of neutral. It was not that I was good enough. It was not that I was not good enough. I'm just here. It's just like it's happening right now here. That's it. It's, there is no more judgment about good or bad. This is it. This is what's happening. And um, over a longer time, because now we're talking about 18 years, these um, patterns or structures of the mind seem to have simply um, dissolved. What about these tendencies? Must these be removed before self-realization can become permanent? And how to remove the tendencies of the mind? Well, as I've just said, um, you don't have to do anything. What you have to do, if you like, is to have a moment of self-realization. If you realize the self, these structures disappear by themselves. So I would say that there's no need to remove these structures. And certainly in my case, I didn't remove all the structures. I can remember in those, at that time when the self-realization happened, I remember having very strong structures about, you know, I'm not going to survive, I'm not good enough. I mean, I was full of all this normal kind of conditioned um, judgments about myself like everybody else. And I'd been tormented by those structures for many years. And I could also see on a deeper level that there were all kinds of desires inside me which were, you know, uh, taking me out, if you like, into the world, you know, ideas from my father about being successful or something, you see. So they had tormented me for 48 years. And um, <clears throat> still, after years of practice and years of doing some workshops, those things still continued. So there isn't a lot you can do with those tendencies. I would say that it's very good to build up the self-awareness, to see and understand the tendencies. So doing some workshops and doing... Um, practice like self-inquiry can bring you into a, a deeper understanding of, of what these things are, what's going on inside. But I don't know anything you can really do to remove them. And I don't really see any need to remove them. Um, it may be that if you've had some very strong kind of abuse in your early childhood and you have a very particular kind of... Um, Um, what's the word? Structure? Hmm? Structure or yeah, mechanism? More like a shock. I, I guess I would say an abuse. Trauma. A trauma, yeah, a trauma. The right. If you have some kind of trauma, and this trauma is constantly working every day in your life, like some people, for example, they've been maybe abandoned by their parents, for example, and in that abandonment, there is an emotional... Um, trauma. <clears throat> it may be necessary to investigate that. It may be necessary to do some psychology, some, some therapy to look at that. So that I could suggest in severe cases. That's not going to remove them. That's only going to, if you like, loosen the, the hold. It's going to put some bandages on them. That's going to make it a little easier. 
So there's nothing really to remove the tendencies, and I don't see any need to remove the tendencies. It's absolutely good if you have a strong awareness about the tendencies. And then my own experience 18 years ago was that out of this self-realization, out of the uh, dissolving of the attachment, there was nobody left to hold those structures, to hold those ideas and concepts. And so basically they ran out of energy. They just simply ran out of energy, dissolving into the blue sky. And so I would say the movement inside Premananda in the last 18 years has been a movement towards um, a deeper and deeper sense of emptiness or silence. And so, for example, today, right now, if I would look inside, um, Nothing, completely empty. So where these words come from, it's not coming out of, you know, Premananda's uh, game box of tricks. You know, it's somehow it's it's coming through. You know, it's coming through. And um, this is very beautiful, actually. So removing the tendencies is a very beautiful thing but you don't have to do anything. They will simply disappear once the attachment to this separate me has been perceived clearly. Then, from my own experience, they slowly disappear. And in this slowly disappearing, you come into a deeper and deeper connection to, if you like, the self or to silence. Mm -hmm. We have a little bit of a similar question. It has been suggested that the mind must be destroyed for liberation to occur. Do you have a mind and how to destroy the mind? Well, again, you see, this is something that apparently Ramana is quoted. I mean, this is a quotation, I think, from, from Sri Ramana. But again, I think this is where in the translation something wasn't done in a sensitive way because then we, we're left with the, what does it mean by mind, I think, you see. So Sri Ramana became famous because apparently he had no mind, you see. And then because he became famous, became a famous saint, because apparently he had no mind, then everybody's trying to become uh, no mind, coming into a no mind, have no mind. And so let's, let's get rid of the mind, yeah? But the reality, of course, is that if you look at Sri Ramana's life, he used to work for years in the kitchen. And I think you can agree that if you work in a kitchen, then you need something called mind to function in the kitchen. You have to take this and that, put them together, stick them in a pot, put on the fire, and cook something. You know? And for that, you could do with a mind. He also, there is film of him sitting reading the newspaper. And again, if you read the newspaper, you need some mechanism to interpret what you're reading, what you're seeing, to you know what we what we would consider to be our mind. You see? And then later, when they were, ashram was being built, he was on a daily basis supervising the construction of the ashram and designing even the ashram. And for that, also, you need uh, a mind. You know, you need a mind to figure out where the door's going to be. So just looking at Sri Ramana's own life, he apparently had a mind. But what does it mean by mind? And I think this is the, the point of this quotation, you see. It's not that you remove, if you like, the functioning, practical, daily mind. It's that you, you um, remove the conditioned mind. You, you remove the ideas, the concepts, the all the stuff we've been sort of filled up with from being a little kid, all this stuff um, needs to be removed and becomes easily removed once this moment of self-realization occurs. And if you look at the mind or if you look at thoughts, because what is the mind if it isn't just thoughts? If you look at thoughts, they arise spontaneously. 
and one thought arises and almost immediately it's replaced by another thought that arises. And so, if you like, one thought destroys the next thought. Uh, sorry, one, the next thought destroys the previous thought. So, in fact, thoughts are constantly destroying each other. And so the mind is constantly, if you like, self-destructing. We could even call that death and, and being reborn. You know, death, what is death, after all, you see? And so we could say that, you know, in every moment, death is occurring because in every moment the old thought is, is leaving and a new thought, which we could call reborn or being born, is, is happening. And this is a constant process that goes on through the whole span of our lives in every, every second. And so um, we can relax about the mind. The mind is not the enemy. It's not the mind that's the enemy, it's the attachment to the conditioned part of the mind which makes it impossible really to see who we truly are. And this, for example, is where um, meditation can be a support. As I was saying earlier, if you have a particularly busy mind that's been particularly filled up, and you're full of all kinds of chaotic thoughts all the time, meditation can, if you like, uh, reduce the activity of the conditioned mind. And so meditation has its, has its function, has um, its value, I would say. Come to the next question. What about destiny? Do you expect things to simply happen? Or are you expressing your free will and choosing? Well, before this interview, the question was, which shirt should I wear? Luckily, I have a few shirts, and so there was a choice. And so, together with uh, a few helpers, this, this shirt was chosen. And I would say that in these kind of small details of our life, we have a choice. But if I would look back in the, in the, in the full flow of my life, then I can, can say that there's been enormous changes in direction. And it seems that in each of those moments where there was a huge change in direction, I, somebody, called Premananda, had nothing much to do with it. It just sort of happened. I can give you two examples. Um, <clears throat> in this period when I was around 30, and when I was um, starting to deeply search, existence picked me up because I, at that time, was an architect. I had some Japanese architect friends. They invited me to Japan. I thought, oh, that's a good idea. I can investigate Zen. You know, I was a bit interested in Zen. So after I went to Japan, I thought for just a few months, and then I got interested in Japanese culture, and then I got some jobs there, and I ended up spending three and a half years in Japan. And during this time, I met a man, actually a professor of architecture, who told me, well, Premananda, you're absolutely ready for meeting my master. I think you should go to India. And he introduced me to Osho. And I remember this was a very sort of profound meeting with this man because we'd spent the whole night talking together until the sun came up in the morning. But when he said, go and meet my master, you're ready for that, I remember inside my mind was a very strong feeling of, I'm not interested. One year later, I was standing in the ashram. In, and I got there in miraculous circumstances where I had gone to Europe with my um, to-be Japanese wife. And um, the plane that was to take us back to Japan had a power failure, a mechanical failure. And we were rerouted and given an Air India ticket. And as we approached Delhi Airport on the way back to Tokyo, my mouth opened and said, why don't we get out here? And then we got out. 
in those days you could do stuff like that. And, um, and then I ended up traveling through India at no cost because it turned out that they'd given us a regular ticket. And I ended up in Pune in the ashram that my friend had suggested. And yet my mind, I remember, clearly said, I'm not interested. And when I walked into this ashram, there was an immediate, immediate feeling that in this place, I can get the answer to my question. And this, is, this is when I was about 30. So this was after 10 years of this internal question. I didn't know what the question was, but it was a strong feeling I can get the answer to this question. About seven years, seven or eight years ago, I was living in Australia. And um, there was a sort of inner message telling me that maybe now is the time to go back to Europe. I was actually having quite a nice time. I just met a new, uh, a new lady in my life who later became my wife, my second wife. And I was actually having quite a nice lifestyle in Australia. But there was perhaps some feeling that um, I missed something about European culture. And then this message came. And so I accepted the message the circumstances of my life around me also supported this decision. Like the owner of my apartment wanted his apartment back. My car completely broke down, so I couldn't even repair it. And so it felt a clear feeling of, okay, I go back to Europe. And sure enough, after staying in India on the way, I ended up two years later in, in Europe without really knowing where in Europe I was going to go. And on the way, I had met a French woman. And this French woman had told me about a friend in Germany who was an alternative doctor with a big house, who would be exactly the kind of host who would be happy to bring his friends and his patients to meet me. And she took me to her friend in Germany, in North Germany, in a small town. This was about uh, seven years ago now. I think. And since then, I've been living in Germany, you see. And my whole life took off in Germany. I met lots of students. Together, after about, about a year, these students came together with me, and we formed a community. So now, since about six years, I've been living in a community. And this community has been blossoming and developing in those years. And um, I'm an English man choosing to live in Germany. But actually, there was not that choice, you see. And if I would have been asked in Australia, well, are you going back to live in Germany? Are you going to live in Germany? I would have said, absolutely not. I'm not interested in Germany. I, perhaps I'd like to go to Spain, where there's lots of sunshine, or Italy, Tuscany. I'm, I like all the architecture and, uh, and painting and art and so on in Tuscany. Maybe I would go to Tuscany. Um, but I certainly wouldn't have chosen Germany because, unfortunately, being English, I was con conditioned against Germany, you see. And now I'm living for six years in Germany. My whole life has prospered, and I have a terribly, absolutely lovely time living here in Germany. So those are two quite dramatic examples where, if you like, my conditioned mind and my intuitive mind have produced completely different, different results. And I would call that the workings of destiny. It appears essential to meet a master and surrender to that master. Who is the master? What is the master's role? How to recognize a true master? Mm. Well, I, I would agree that this is essential. In my own life, I had two masters. And um, I think if I would look back in my life, when I was 30, um, I was completely lost. I was completely lost and stupid. I mean, I was intelligent enough and I was educated enough. I was like an ordinarily successful guy functioning as an architect. 
But in another way, I was completely stupid. I didn't really understand very much on a deeper level. And without bumping into Osho, a master, I don't think I would have really, my life would really have changed. So Osho provided a very important service in those days by, if you like, offering an alternative. And the off what he was offering in those days was that through meditation I could come to enlightenment. And that felt like a very good deal. And I basically gave up my life as an architect and said, okay, I go for enlightenment. So in that moment, the master was very, very important. Maybe I could say that, that by then I had enough under inner, inner understanding that there was, if you like, a certain resonance be, between my inner intuition and what the master was saying. So in another way, I could say that the true master, the ultimate master, is your own self, your own intuition. So if you have a connection to yourself, then the master on the outside becomes unnecessary. But for most people, we're so identified that we need a somebody, you know, we're identified to be a somebody, and therefore we need a, a living somebody on the outside um, to, um, well, to, to, to do various things. And in, 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 in my own case, when I was 30, I needed Osho to offer this um, enlightenment to me. And he offered it in a very charismatic and exciting way. And I bought the story and my life completely changed. So I would say that that was a very important moment where a master was needed. And then later, after I had left Osho, well, actually Osho left me, and then I, I came to Papaji um, after, if you like, many years of experience and understanding and then I met this second master. And in the meeting with this second master, um, I came, if you like, to realize that my conditioned ideas about spirituality, which I'd mostly got from, from Osho, um, were simply wrong. It was simply a wrong idea, as far as I can, can understand. It's a wrong idea. It was a wrong idea. And the right idea was given to me from Papaji, who had got this idea clearly from Sri Ramana and who had got this from the ancient wisdom of India. So this is, this is why in the beginning I think I was saying that I feel very much um, like I'm speaking as a channel for this lineage of uh, the ancient wisdom, maybe through Shankara to Ramana Maharshi to Papaji, and then these words are not Pramananda's teaching at all. The only thing that Pramananda can take credit for is in the, um, in the communication. I hope in the sim sim simplicity and clarity of the communication. That is personal, if you like. So that's, if you like, the master, the part that's the master. But um, I think a master, an external master, is essential. And in a way, his main role is to show you that you are the same as the master. So the master is not trying to, 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 to make himself special. He's not trying to make you less. Some people have this idea that if you become involved in a spiritual master, you are if you like surrendering to another human being and therefore you're making yourself somehow you know, less and you're making yourself um, susceptible to some kind of abusive situation. Mm -hmm. That's not a true master. A true master would never ever work in that way. A true master wants you to realize that you are the same. He is the self and you are the self. Everybody is the self. We're just... We're all the self, it's all one. So the whole effort of the master is to bring you through your ignorance to some clarity about who you are. Mm -hmm.
That's the, the true work of the master. I understand that you think a master is important. Do you make yourself available as a master? Well, I do not make myself available as a master. So, for example, in my life at the moment, um, I travel sometimes and conduct public meetings. So in that, in that situation, um, I sit in a chair separate from the audience. And it, in that situation, in, if you like, I'm presented as a spiritual master. And then those people can project onto me whatever they feel like, and they can make me into a master or they can make me into whatever they like. You know? In here in the community where I live most of my life now, because I've decided to, to travel much less, so being here in the community on a daily basis, living with about 18 to 20 people, um, I see myself as those people's friend. You see? It's not, it's not that I see myself running around, oh, here's the master, here's the master. No, I'm just a friend. And what is this friend doing? He's doing whatever he can on a daily basis to show people what they need to see in order to come to freedom. So this is very, a very friendly kind of connection. I can't really have much to do with what those people are projecting onto me. Um, there are situations where I could say I'm the master because there are certain situations where I would act perhaps in a masterful way. For example, uh, in, the, in, the, in the running of this community for the last uh, six years, we've had several major crises where the community could easily have finished. And in those situations, if I would look back, I can say that Premananda, together with the residents of the community, we acted in a masterful way and the community continued. So in that way, there is something of mastership happening. But fundamentally, um, I think it's important that um, a master, a true master, would never run around saying, I'm a master, I'm a master, you know, I need a big chair and a special um, something or other. You know, it's, not, it's not working like that. Can you may say more about the daily um, connection with the people in the community? Um, you what, would like me to talk about the community? Yes. Um, well, first of all, the community happened almost by accident. I, I, could, I could admit that for many years I liked a, an idea to have some kind of urban ashram or a kind of community of people in the West who are focused on, if you like, inner work or spiritual, spiritual work, you know. I liked this idea and I was attracted to, to live in such a place. But there was no real idea of creating such a place. And then again, I would say from destiny, various things came together. There was a farmer who had a beautiful old farm in the Black Forest where he was taking care of people's horses. And he offered me, first of all, he offered me a few days to visit. I visited, I liked it, and I asked him, well, could I come with a few students? Because he'd built a big meditation room. And I said, well, could we come here and use your beautiful room for, for a couple of weeks to have a retreat? He said, yes. Then he responded in a very hospitable way, and he spent his own money to... to renovate the farm a bit so that the retreat could be more comfortable. Not 20 people, but more like 50 people came. And these people really liked his farm a lot. They loved the meditation room, which was above his stables for the horses. They loved the horses. 
they loved the nature, and there was a feeling like, well, could we live here? And the farmer said, yes, why not? And so spontaneously, a community started. It was about 16 or 18 people in the beginning. And this community has continued now for about six years. And after some time, we shifted from the Black Forest. So now the community is, um, we live in a 17th century mansion, which is right on the bank of the Rhine with beautiful nature around. Hmm? Close to, very close to Cologne, uh, in the center of Europe, with international airports just 20 minutes drive. So we're very well connected. And the house itself has got a very um, conscious owner who has been very much supporting what we're doing in his house. In the beginning, you know, we were a little bit nervous to talk about our spiritual uh, ideas and uh, how we organized ourselves. So in the beginning, we were a little nervous. And gradually, he came to understand what we're doing here. And he was very sympathetic towards us. And we have been able to develop the property over the last uh, four years, four or five years. So now we've created a very beautiful uh, community uh, premises where we have a painting studio, a music studio, a dance studio, a seminar space for workshops, and we have um, a room for giving uh, satsang meetings. Traditionally, devotees had tremendous devotion to the master. Please say something about devotion in the pursuit of awakening. Hmm. Pretty essential and pretty natural. So, as I've already suggested in the last question, I personally would say that a, a living master is essential if you really, truly want to become free. And my own understanding and experience, my own experience, is that if you have this true longing inside you, a master will appear in your life and you will recognize this master and you will surrender to this master. You will fall in love with this master. You will become devoted to this master. So that happened to me twice in my life. Well, actually it's happened three times in my life. So when, when I was 30, I came in contact with Osho. And when I first met him, he was sitting on a podium with maybe a thousand people sitting at his feet. He, was a, he seemed to be a very incredible human being. And I was, if you like, in awe of him. You know? So in the beginning, there was not, I was not really devoted to him. I was kind of in awe of him. But gradually, as I stayed with him year by year, I would say that this awe changed into a very deep devotion. Um, devotion being um, something to do with um, surrender, something to do with uh, trust. And I would say this trust and surrender increased as I came into a deeper and deeper relationship with Osho. And um, I never looked in all those years. I never had looked for any other master. I never had any question to go to any other master. I was, if you like, devoted to, to Osho. It was only after he left his body uh, and I was still living close by his ashram that the circumstances of my life took me to another master. It wasn't that, if you like, I fell out of love with Osho or something. It was not like that. This devotion that had, had, had gradually increased inside me, this, this profound love, um, had increased to such an extent that I could call myself a devoted person. You know, I was a devotional person. My heart had opened. And... And with this open heart, I could accept the second master, Papaji. And 
again, when I met Papaji, and then this moment of self-realization happened, there was a sense of total trust, total devotion, total surrender, and I never thought to go anywhere. And so I stayed for five years, and even after five years, if he hadn't been giving me this kind of inter internal message, go, 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 time to go, 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 which I resisted for a whole year, I don't think I, don't think I, would, I would still be living there, I think. You know, even if he wouldn't be there, I might be still there, because there was a sort of bubble of love, you see. And this bubble of love, I would say, is the most profound love affair, you see. And with this profound love affair, uh, many things became possible, you see. Because in the time after this um, moment of self-realization, in those five years I stayed going to his satsangs, meeting him sometimes personally, and living, if you like, in the Sangha around Papaji, my work had not finished, you see. So what was still necessary was some kind of cleaning, cleaning of the, of the vasanas, of the tendencies, and some kind of settling or grounding of this whole sort of fantastic moment that all that energy would gradually get grounded into my daily life. And it seemed that it needed some time, it needed these five years. And so being there in Papaji's energy field, you know, in a totally devotional way, I could deal with, with the, the hard knocks. Because if you stay with the master, it's not all strawberries and cream. Absolutely not. It's a very uh, fashionable spiritual idea that, you know, around the master, you, everything is peace and love and wonderful, you know. But actually, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that around Osho, and it wasn't like that around Papaji. And as far as I can understand, it wasn't like that around Ramana Mahashi. There's a tremendous devotion, but sometimes he, he hits me really hard. I remember one day, everybody was greeting him. They were coming in, and there was a big line of people. We were coming in one by one and giving him a garland. It was on Guru Panima Day. It's the day when you, you say thank you, if you like, to, to the master. And... Um, and anyway, so he would, he would get the garland, he would look in your eyes, and then the garland which he'd given to his assistant, he would then give back to you. So it was a very intimate, sweet 30 seconds or one minute that you had with the master, you know. And we'd been preparing all day, we'd gone to buy our favorite garland, and there, we, there I was in the queue. I watched the people in front of me, they were all having their lovely moment, looking in his eyes, and it was all very wonderful, you see. And then when I kneeled down in front of me, in that moment, he looked up on the ceiling and saw a fly on the ceiling. And he didn't look in my eyes, and I didn't have this wonderful moment. And it was like he'd hit me with the biggest hammer you could imagine in the world. It took me maybe days to recover from that, you see. So being with a master is not um, all lovely. And after something like that happened, you can easily get on a train and, and run away, you see. So this devotion, you ask me about devotion, it feels to me that devotion is very important because in this bond of love, in the, if you like, the open heart connection, in the one heart, there is a tremendous energetic support for going through uh, very difficult moments. Because if you really want to become free, then the work is not finished at the moment of self-realization. The work, the spiritual work, continues. And this is to do with, if you like, cleaning up everything, cleaning up uh, particularly the conditioned mind. And for that, the master is very valuable again because he has the insight to see. So, for example, this moment when he found the fly on the ceiling was obviously because he could see my mind, he could see my 
uh, expectation, and he didn't want to uh, follow my expectation, like any good master. So he gave me a hard knock. But it may have been a week later when I was standing in his satsang somewhere in the corner, completely content, completely silent, not needing anything from him. Maybe in that moment he would walk right through the room, stand in front of me, look directly in my eyes and flood me with love, you see. So you would get the sticks and you would get the carrots. And the sticks were not always so easy to deal with. And um, devotion was a big support for that. So my own feeling is that just naturally devotion is part of the relationship with the master. So, for example, in, in the Indian terminology, there is yana and bhakta. And bhakta is the way of devotion. It's the way of the heart. And jnana is the way of understanding and knowledge. And that is more my kind of um, Western educated way, you could say. But I think also I have a lot of um, this sort of bhakti energy inside me. And I would say the two together have taken me on a journey. And there are some spiritual traditions, like, for example, some of the Sufi traditions, where it's almost completely back to you. It's completely singing, dancing. Um, it's a completely different kind of approach to the Advaita Vedanta, self-inquiry, understanding approach to truth. So there are different approaches to truth but they bring you in the end to, of course, the same and only truth, the one truth. Mm. Um, this, this way of the heart, uh, could you say that loving beauty is also part of it? To be in love with beauty, to recognize beauty? I'm not sure if it's the way of the heart. I don't, I'm not sure if, if, if beauty is, the, is part of the way of the heart, but I think the, um, the word beauty, the word truth, the word peace, and the word love, I would say all those four words, which I think have a slightly different flavor, those are all in a way pointing to the same truth. So, for example, um, if I think of myself one day, I was walking in the Louvre in Paris, fantastic art gallery, and they have like a main, um, I don't know what they call it, it's, it's a, anyway, a huge gallery. Maybe it's even a kilometer long, I don't know. It's a huge, long gallery, very wide, And the paintings are two, one on top of the other, because they seem to have, you know, they have so many paintings. And I was walking down this corridor, well, gallery. And as I walked down this gallery, looking at the paintings, of course, I was somehow touched by the beauty of these paintings. And then at a certain point in my walk, I had to stop. I just had to stop. I stopped and I looked at one particular painting. And this painting somehow very much touched me inside. And I could say, well, it's beautiful. You know, it's a beautiful painting. And then I wondered, well, I wonder who painted this painting because I was just walking along. I wasn't looking at the labels. And then when I looked, it was painted by Leonardo da Vinci, who's one of the, the famous painters. Yeah. So how did I recognize this one particular painting from a great master? And then, then I was sort of interested, so I kind of examined what was going on. And I don't know if it's really true, but my sense was that if I looked at this painting, it was as if the painter, the artist, was communicating with me. There was a kind of communication. And what he was communicating was not the objects in the painting or the colors, But on a deep level, he was communicating his own self. So he was communicating the self of the artist 
to the self of the watcher of the of the painting and of course what he was communicating was the same self so he, there was a, a oneness in watching this painting i was experiencing oneness because this painting was put together by somebody who was painting in a state of oneness and it was being watched by somebody in a state of oneness and so there was just oneness and therefore inside myself you could say the, the the word beauty arose so in that sense i'm saying beauty and truth are not different and there are various works of art um for example some of michelangelo's uh, sculptures for example which almost everybody would consider to be beautiful and there are certain uh natural phenomena like a sunrise or a, a rainbow or a, or a certain kinds of waterfall or something like this that almost everybody would consider to be beautiful so what does it mean beauty what does that word actually mean and it seems to me that beauty means that you are getting getting touched inside what is getting touched is it your heart that's getting touched yes you feel maybe more open hearted at in a beautiful sunrise or sunset but i think actually it's touching the same place um as truth is touching as love is touching as peace is touching it's touching the self Seekers often have curious ideas about the enlightened state. Please describe your typical day and how you perceive the world. Mm. Well, first of all, I don't have any typical day. My days are very kind of varied. full of all kind of actions and uh, discussions and emailings and telephone calls and all that because I'm actively involved in this community life um if I would have known maybe how that was going to be in the beginning I might not now be sitting in a community but anyway here I am and but my daily life is very much mostly caught up with the workings of the community and work, the workings of what's going on here with the people who live here and um uh very much to do with um for example this book project film projects having having meetings spiritual meetings to try to touch people i'm always incredibly available at any moment in my day i'm always available for anybody who has a genuine uh question or genuine desire to meet me i'm always available i make myself always available and um otherwise i could say my life is uh, my daily life is very ordinary you know i have breakfast um you know my day goes on however it goes on i have lunch or i don't have lunch sometimes and so on you know there's i i i get supported by the community so i don't have to do my own washing for example and my room gets tidied up for me so i get some perks here but otherwise my life is very much the same as everybody else's life um i have a car i drive my car you know i uh sometimes feel like going to an art gallery i go to an art gallery i i i am uh, enjoy painting so sometimes uh, rarely at the moment but I, sometimes i would paint um i can use my computer and i use it every day to send uh, many emails and receive many emails and um i communicate throughout the world um something that's rather unique i think is that in the last year we've developed a means of 
of um, what we call satsang TV, which is um, that the meetings here in the house are televised or filmed and they are communicated through the internet and people anywhere in the world can watch these meetings on their computer, which is, I find, a wonderful um, part of my daily life now. But there are a few things like that which are a little un unusual, but basically like every other human being, uh, my life is, uh, is the same. Um, I guess the, the, the biggest difference, the, the, the biggest, um, the one thing that makes my life maybe uh, not ordinary or extraordinary, I don't know the right word, is that um, if, I, if I stop, then it's just quiet. So if I can remember my life, say, uh, 30 years ago, I remember how my conditioned mind was always driving, was always driving me. There was always, I always needed to get something. I was always not really content. There was always somehow problems or some kind of suffering going on. Um, strong emotions, sometimes very negative emotions going on inside. All this is not in my life anymore. So um, there's a lot of space inside. And I see that in my own case that I'm very active and I like to play different games. And so, for example, just before this interview, I had my uh, beard trimmed for the interview. And while that was happening, I was talking to the person who's going to organize something for me. And, you know, I can do two or three things at almost at the same time because there's not any pressure from my, uh, my conditioned mind, doesn't pressure on me. And so having, a, if you like, a ground of peace and emptiness, silence, uh, makes my life, I think, a little unusual and allows me many possibilities that I think I wouldn't be able to, to manage if I didn't have that. So I could say that this happening that, that was 20, nearly 20 years ago now has made a dramatic shift in my life, but in essence, nothing has changed. So this thing about, you know, before enlightenment, chopping wood and carrying water, and after enlightenment, chopping wood and carrying water, there has been no I am enlightened, but there is a shift. And in this shift, um, in one way, everything is the same, and in another way, everything is different. Could you say something about creativity and how the, the peace can... Uh manifest in creativity for you and for other people well, around you, maybe? Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's something that I've watched happening in this community over the last six years that um, at a certain point, it was obvious that, you know, there was a sort of energy of creativity happening in the community. And maybe in the beginning, I might have thought, well, I'm a painter, I'm kind of creative person. So maybe the people who, who have come to me are kind of creative people. But I don't think that's maybe particularly the case. It may be slightly the case. I think What has been happening in this community, because this community has become increasingly, increasingly creative, um, is that as you come into, a, into silence, as you come into emptiness, as your mind gets uh, less and less of a hold on you, as there, if you like, is more space inside, what to do? What to do? Because anyway, we're here, we have a life, what to do with this life? And I think without really choosing anything, I think what happens is that creativity naturally comes out of silence. And so as 
somebody in the community has become more silent, if you like, less, less squeezed by their conditioned mind, there's more space inside and suddenly they start playing the piano, which maybe they did it before, but never very much. And suddenly they start playing and it becomes a kind of passion. There's somebody here who, um, who did exactly that. There's somebody else here who um, bought a flute and started to play the flute and actually it's lovely. And then suddenly we have a, a, some, somebody here who starts to sing and everybody says, wow, go on, go on. And they get support for their singing and, and somehow they get passion for, for singing. Somebody else likes to dance at any moment. Um, so it seems that, that just naturally in our community, as people have become more and more silent, because we have people here who have lived here three years, four years, even from the beginning of the community, five or six years. And in that longer time, I would say that people have got a tremendous benefit. Whether or not they become self-realized is another question, which I don't think I could really um, have much to say about because I'm so close to the people here, it's hard for me to, to make that kind of judgment. But I would say that there's no doubt that everybody who, who has lived in the community and left or is still living in the community um, has, has made incredible changes and has come into a much greater flow in their lives. And for many of those people, what has actually happened, if you like, to express that is some form of creativity. And so we call ourselves now a satsang and art community because increasingly uh, we're dancing, singing, um, making music and painting and so on. And I can imagine that this will become uh, more and more, um, a more and more profound expression of our community. In fact, from the beginning, we've had an art gallery in our community where we've welcomed outside painters and sculptures and photographers. We made a decision right in the beginning that we would only exhibit work that comes out of silence and that we would not exhibit any kind of mindy, conditioned mindy stuff. And actually, in the beginning, I thought, well, probably we won't have many paintings you see. But actually, we found all kind of funny guys that we've had two exhibitions, for example, where the artist painted almost completely in white paint. Right. And if I say that, it sounds even a little bit strange, but actually they were beautiful exhibitions. And both these people, both these artists um, clearly were painting out of a deep sense of silence, of, of meditation. So um, I think there is something very natural in the, in the combination of silence and uh, creativity. You have given us a profound discourse on awakening. When you would meet someone with a passion for awakening, what would your short advice be? <clears throat> well, of course, it would depend on each individual person. I don't have a kind of uh, stock answer to that. Yeah, But my stock answer would be to give that person encouragement in some way, to give that person support in some way. I mean, the reality here in the West, it may be different in the East, but in the West, the basic energy in the society is not really supporting somebody who has a passion for awakening. It's supporting somebody who has a passion for hard work and making money, you know, material things get supported. And so um, I would say that if I would meet such a person, and luckily in my daily life I meet lots of such people, then in any way I can I would give them support to continue their passion. And I think the biggest way that I can do that, actually, is to invite that person to come and spend some time in our community. And what has happened in the last few years is that I feel that our community came to some kind of um, 
I don't know the right way to express it. Energy exp level, maybe? I don't know quite the right way to express it, but it, it's as if the community came to a certain takeoff point. You know, the energy um, was rising to such a point that anybody who walks in the front door who is sensitive is going to feel a kind of love, a kind of energy. And this love or energy is very much supporting somebody who has a passion for awakening. And so increasingly we get people coming for one week, two weeks to volunteer themselves in the work of the, of the community and to take some benefit of this energy. I think at the moment we have 10 or 12 volunteers here for a shorter time, as well as the residents who live here you know, all the time. So I think my, my basic um, support, the, my, my, my most uh, strong support I could give somebody would be to say, well, if you really have this passion, come and, come and be here for some, some time and get our support. Because um, in the outer world, in the, in, the, in the normal world, this passion for awakening does not really get supported. In fact, probably it in many ways gets denied. And I've met many people who've told me that they've had some kind of opening or awakening when they were younger, and it was even frightening. It was frightening what happened to them because there was nobody to give them support. There was nobody to tell them what's happening. And they felt very kind of lost in their, in their awakening, if you like. So anybody like that that I would meet, I would say to them, come here. Thank you. Is there anything you wish to add to this dialogue? No, just a small observation and thanks. You know, I mean, thank you both because you did a great job with the camera and the, and the, and the questioning. And it was very really interesting. In the beginning, I was somehow aware that, you know, you were asking me the questions and I was answering the questions. But at a certain point, um, it wasn't really any more clear who was asking the questions and who was answering the questions, you know? And it felt very lovely, actually. It was a very lovely flow happening. And I don't know, maybe you also felt that. Yeah. And so that's why these interviews become very profound because what really happens is that the most important thing that happens through the interview is a total meeting in presence. That's what really happened. And that's why, for example, that in the last about six years, I've interviewed what must be nearly 50 masters mm -hmm. from, the, from India and from the West. And naturally, these guys, a lot of these guys have become some kind of friend now because the actual hour and a half of the interview was so profound. Recently, for example, I interviewed Krishna Das in Amsterdam and the meeting with him in, in about two hours was so profound that for most of the interview I was just crying. You know? And so I would feel now that Krishna Das and, and myself, we're, we're, we're very close. I don't know what he feels, but uh, mm. certainly on my side there is this deep connection. You see? So the interview is very, very beautiful and uh, um, yeah, it's a meeting himself, is in presence.